Greetings and welcome to the first episode of Accountability Conversations for the year 2023. I am your host, Tanatana Mount Banda. Well, as you know, this is a show where we disseminate information about so- social, political and economic issues that affect us as a nation. And most importantly, try to find out ways in how we can divulge as young people and the entire nation finding out solutions. Well, today I have a very special guest. Sir, may you introduce yourself? Hi, thank you so much, uh, Tim. My name is Dissent Vajila. I'm delighted to be here today on this conversation. And I hope we are going to share a lot of experiences, notes and discoveries. Wow, thank you so much. I'm so happy to have you. Well, today we are talking about a very crucial uh, topic. As you know, that 2023 is a year where we are having our elections. Today we are delving much on delimitation, which is generally drawing constituencies and boundaries for electoral processes. But well, as an expert, DC Vajila, we have you here with us. May you just explain your understanding of delimitation according to Section 161. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not sure what an expert in elections uh, <laughs> would look like. Uh, somebody has voted the most or somebody has done what. But uh, thank you so much uh, for the, the, the question. I think basically you put it uh, well as an introduction that uh, delimitation is a process using which uh, boundaries of constituencies and wards are drawn using numbers of registered voters and other considerations that are uh, enshrined in section 161.6 uh, of the Constitution of Zimbabwe, which include physical fixtures, uh, which include the uh, mode of transport, which include systems of communication, which include uh, cultural and traditional boundaries, and also making sure that uh, no uh, word is drawn in such a way that uh, it falls under uh, different districts while it is uh, the same word, or no constituency is drawn in such a way that it is one constituency but it falls under two different provinces. So those are some of the considerations that are there, but in essence, it is about the drawing of boundaries of constituencies and wards using the population of registered voters and other considerations. Okay, that's beautiful. There, there's something interesting that you said, uh, which we consider even geographical aspects. But when you look back, delimitation has mainly been focused on numbers. Now, how, how does it affect not considering these other aspects according to, to Part 6 of Section 161? It does really affect, uh, there are some constituencies that become too sparse, uh, mm-hmm. that become, uh, you, 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 you are unable as a member of parliament to travel from one corner of the constituency to another without leaving the constituency, getting into another and back mm-hmm. into your own. So it has been uh, problematic over a long period of time. Uh, that is why also section 161.6 of the constitution uh, creates conditions under which uh, the issue of numbers can be wavered because often the geography of the constitution uh, is created so that we are searching for numbers mm-hmm. if there are numbers here and there are numbers there and there are numbers there mm-hmm. in order for these numbers to constitute a numeric constitu- a constituency or a numeric a word we then have to bring all these numbers together but we can't push those people from where they reside to a different place that is why a waiver is then created uh, by uh, section 161.6 of the constitution okay yes okay wow that's so beautiful well looking back from the inception of this process uh, how has it been like from registration of voters to date Voter registration is continuous uh, in Zimbabwe. It does not stop. It does not uh, come to an end. What comes to an end are certain dates that are set. For example, the cutoff date using which the delimitation uh, data is going to be uh, taken out from. Uh, It's usually a cutoff. In our case, it was 30 May 2022. Uh, There is also a cutoff date using which registered voters can participate in in an election. So, for example, if you vote after the sitting of, if you register to vote after the sitting of the nomination court, you can't vote. If you, it's a by-election, you register to vote after uh, the vacancy has been created, you don't get to to, to, to register to vote. However, um, while the process is continuous, it is facing the obvious challenges, one of them which you have already mentioned, the issue of distances. 
in the sense that uh, Zeki has got stationary offices, uh, they have these outreaches that even if they come, they get affected by numerous uh, challenges. One of the challenges being the availability of identity documents, which are key to the voter registration process. Mm -hmm. So people have not been able to travel uh, to where Zeki offices are. For example, I'll give you an example of a place like uh, Umkuza. Uh, Umkuza voter registration offices will be far, for example, from Rangemo. Yes. But the people who stay in Rangemo have to be registered to vote in Umkuza. You talk of places like uh, uh, Umzingwane, people who stay from as far afield as Gilo, uh, Irisville, the only place where they can get registered to vote is Escortin. Mm -hmm. I can go on and on. So the distance to ZEC registration office has been a hindrance uh, to many. But however, there has been other hindrances that have been uh, removed. For example, you no longer need proof of residence to get registered to vote. Mm -hmm. You just need to call the fill an affidavit and say, I stay in Kulmane, that affidavit is enough. It, you don't need to have a, 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 a water bill or some other proof that says this is where you stay. So that's how voter registration has been happening. Um, of late, I've seen political parties, I've seen civil society organizations uh, like Project Vote 263, like uh, Election Resource Center, trying to push uh, young people to get registered to vote for the first time. So I think that's uh, in essence how the, 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 the voter registration process has been going. And I think there isn't much that uh, we can complain about, save for this fact that ZEC needs to have more outreaches to get to people more frequently. I would be great with a situation like every two months, ZEC okay, goes out. Just to cut you off, there, there's an interesting uh, concept that you brought out about the range more in uh delimitation boundaries. Now, um, moving on back to e e section 961, it talks about are my local authorities having voters that are like 20% more or 20% less than the next constituency? Now, just bringing in this whole thing, how does it affect in the aftermath? The 20% the, the, the rule is, is good in the sense that it tries to make sure that places, um, constituencies and wards are as equal in size as possible. By equality in size, we mean the numeric, quantitative part of, of size, not the qualitative part. So they are as close as possible to, to one another. But the draft report that Zek has preferred now mm -hmm. violates that in literally every respect. Uh, constituencies, some of them are 50% bigger than the other. Mm -hmm. Some of them would be, but the law says they must be within 20% of uh, the, the, the population. What Zek did, it seems like they, 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 they wrote their own law, which says they might be, the, the constituencies and the wards must be 20%, must not be 20% higher or less than the average. But if you read the constitution, it's clear. It says they must not be 20% more or less than each other. You have got a constituency, for example, like Bulawa Central here, which has got, uh, in terms of the draft, has got 22,115 uh, registered voters, which is the smallest constitu constituency nationwide. Mm -hmm. You then have Harare, not Harare, Mount Pleasant. Mount Pleasant as a constituency has got 33,153 registered voters. So the difference between 33,000 and 22,000 is not 20% of one another. It's actually 50 something percent because there's 11,000 and 11,000 is 50 is 50 percent of 22,000 so it's a violation so you bring yours to umkuza you continue with the violations when even you are getting to what level you are continuing with the violations so the draft violates the requirement the 20 percent requirement but to make it worse this calculation uses a 40 percent requirement instead of a 20 percent so on the 20%, uh, the law is clear and it says that uh, there must not be 20% higher or less than uh, each other in terms of numbers. This yes. means that wards must respect that rule. The delimitation of constituencies must also respect that rule. But it doesn't. What Zek did was that it created a, an average size of a ward per each local authority not an average size of the world nationally. 
So what it means is that a ward in Umkuza might actually be 80% less than a ward in Buhera. But these are awards in Zimbabwe. These are awards governed by the same constitution. So there is no different constitution for Umkuza in another constitution for Buhera. There is no constitution for uh, Chinoi in another constitution for Mamba. It's the same constitution. So they must be within 20% of each other. And what they, the, 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 what happened is that after arriving at the average, which is correct, Zek just said there is this number of 5,000, 5, and something uh, registered voters. You divide it by 210, you are going to get your 27,600 and something votes, yeah. which is perfect. Once Zek had done that, it then said they are going to apply 20% range upwards and a 20% range downwards, yeah. effectively creating a 40% range because you have moved 20% up and 20% down. That is why you have got constituencies like Gal Central and the Mount Pleasant that are 50% bigger mm -hmm. than each other. Yeah. It's because of this mathematical error that is like imposed on itself of creating that. So that is problematic because constituencies are now far much bigger than each other than the required constitutional uh, guideline. Uh, wards are far much smaller than each other than the required constitutional uh, guideline. Okay, so um, that is the case. Just to cut you off there, um, where do we then place it evolution in this whole discourse, considering the imbalance of um, demographic delimitations? Well, the devolution doesn't come uh, here much. Mm -hmm. What comes here much is the issue of uh, fair representation of people. Okay. So once you link devolution with fair representation of people, that is where you found devolution coming into play. Because the representation here, mm -hmm. uh, what needs to be answered by Zek is whether they were looking forward to fair representation of people or fair representation of regions fair representation of places. So if you are going to talk about fair representation of places, fine, what they did could make sense. But when it comes to the issue of fair representation of people, it doesn't come on board. There are some people that are far more represented than others. There are some people that are far less represented uh, by others. The power of locals in determining these things is also what Zek took away. Because Zek used to call meetings that it called consultative meetings. But they were not consultative meetings. Yeah. They were information dissemination meetings where Zek was essentially informing stakeholders what it is doing without looking for their opinions around it. I am sure that if opinions of stakeholders were sought about this issue, the question of variance, whether it's 20% or it's 40%, would have been answered at that stage. And I think that Zek has sufficient statistical power within its secretariat, within its commissioners, to understand that which this which they did is wrong. Wow, wow, that's, that's, that's so interesting. And you're bringing in the need for asking a very keynote question. Who must be in charge of this whole delimitation process? Well, Zek is responsible for delimitation. The constitution is clear uh, around that. The responsibility lies with Zek. But there are key stakeholders that ZEC needs to consult. Yeah. And uh, these include civil society, these include political parties, these include people in the military, these include uh, civil servants, these include trade unions, traditional leaders, mm -hmm. and so forth. And ZEC took a position of saying it will inform these stakeholders on what it is doing, not that it will seek their views and opinions. Yeah. If Zek sought the views and opinions of these stakeholders, other than informing them, mm -hmm. much of the things that have been done would not have been done. I trust the strength of the civil society in Zimbabwe. There is so much that is in the report which would not have been there if the civil society was consulted, not necessarily just informed. So Zek took the position, inform, 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 instead of consult, consult, consult. Well, some of the boundaries do not make sense uh, in the sense that they violate even the requirements of common transport systems. Mm -hmm. For example, you have got a constituency here in Bulawayo, like Bulawayo South, yeah. which brings together Bellevue, 
and Makoko, they are one constituency. And you ask yourself, why couldn't you put Bellevue together with Sizin? Okay, which are just neighbor. Okay. Then you chose Bellevue to be with Makoko. And yeah. you ask yourself, why was how was someone thinking when they did that? Okay, just just to, to bring in also a very crucial question because of what you're you're saying out. How frequent should this delimitation be done? considering the, the continuous transformations in demography and other related aspects? That's, that's, that's a very important question. I think also from the side of democracy activists, and I see that much of uh, the pro-democracy activists are young people, mm -hmm. uh, much of whom were not of the voting age group in 2008. Yeah. And so they find this thing kind of violating a lot of things that they've known about what politics is, about what society is, what, what is my ward, what is my constituency. Yeah. Prior to 2008, the limitation was happening every five years. So, when it happened in 2008, it was supposed to happen again in 2018. But the new constitution that was then adopted in 2018 said, no, 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 this is now too frequent. Let's do it once every 10 years. And they said, we are then counting that 10 years from 2013. Okay. But adopting the 2008 boundaries, so the 208 boundaries have been in use, uh, they were adopted in 2013, and the 10-year period that is being counted is 2013 to 2023. This means that we must go for the 2023 elections using new boundaries. Then 2020, 2033 elections using new boundaries. Then 2043 elections using new boundaries, and so forth and so forth. So that's what the law says says it must happen after every 10 years. And it it covers the issues of developments, as we are saying. The demographies are changing, the number of registered people are changing. You expect that you'll be having more people in Country Park over the next year yeah. than you had this year. You expect that you'll be having less people, for example, in Makwekwe, mm -hmm. than we are having now as more people move from Makwekwe, buying their own stands and building their own houses in Country Park and so forth and so forth. So that's the kind of thing. So the period is 10 years, just to be short. Okay, okay. It really has been a mouthful segment, so I think we should go for an hour break. See you straight after the break. Well, welcome to the last segment of our accountability conversation for this episode. I'm still here with you. Your host tonight in the mouth right now. Well, um, so here is my last question for, for, for this show today. Uh, looking at the current conflicts between commissioners about the report, uh, what does it mean for, for the process? Well, the conflict simply means that there are high chances of us going to the 2023 election mm -hmm. using 2008 boundaries. Because in terms of the law, the law says uh, this the, the delimitation report must be gazetted six months mm -hmm. before the due date of the election. The due date of the election, uh, if you read section 143 of the constitution, mm -hmm. it says that uh, the five years must be counted from the date of the election of the swearing in of the president elect. Mm -hmm. So, which means that uh, around August 26, 2023 is the due date of the election. But we are also allowed to hold an election 30 days earlier mm -hmm. than the due date. So, which means from around 26 six July, July yeah. we can have the election. So, six months before 26 July is the 26th of January. Mm -hmm. Six months before 26. Um, August is 26 February. So, which means we must get the report by 26 February. If this report is not out, is not gazetted by 26 February, it also means that we might be going using old boundaries. But also, we might just be playing time. One of the worst stages of time that is happening is that this report has been taken to Kalia. If you read section 161, it's clear that whatever parliament suggests. If ZEC does not agree with the suggestions of Parliament, the views of ZEC stand. So it's unlikely that ZEC is going to be moved by what Parliament is suggesting. 
But the question also that you'll be asking is that given that is two versus seven and Zek, who is Zek now? Who is going to agree or disagree with whatever parliament is going to suggest, with whatever parliament is going to recommend? So who is Zek? Is it the two? Is it the seven? Yeah. And also the question that is being brought forth is whether the report that is before parliament now, is it a Zek report or is it a position of the two? Because there are two uh, uh, commissioners who have put forward that report. The other seven have said no. And that is why we have got a litigant now who has written to Parliament through his lawyer, uh, Professor Matu, to say, can you please ask Parliament on my behalf whether the document that they are discussing now is it a report of set or in the position of the two? So they are going to then go uh, uh, to the ZEC Act. The ZEC Act says ZEC must operate as a body corporate. So as a corporate board, uh, who signed this document on behalf of the corporate board? Is it all the directors? Is it one or two directors? Is it the CEO? So that is the kind of debate that we are being put into as a nation. But the essence of us going into this debate is to delay us to get to 26 February without a report and go back to 2008 Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. A lot of significant concepts have been put in. Well, like I said in our introduction, that accountability conversation is all about now bringing out solutions and now we can be involved as young people and all religious stakeholders. So, considering all the problems um, relating to the delimitation process that we have discussed, what do you think can be done to resolve all those matters? Well, there are issues that young people can do in the short term and in the long term. In the short term, Young people need to register to vote so that they can carry their views because the ultimate solution for us to continue with having these problems or not is the vote. So, young people must register to vote, and young people must turn out in their large numbers. Young people must vote. In addition to voting, young people must contest elections. Young people must challenge the status quo not only by voting but by moving further to actually becoming candidates themselves. Once they become candidates themselves, once they win elections, young people must put themselves in a position to actually defend what might happen to disturb their voice. That's the part one. But the second part is that young people need to start this report yeah. and identify issues that violate what young people stand for, that violate what young people know. Part of the issues is what a young person will see in that report is the wrong mathematics used. Mm -hmm. Young people must actually go and say, the mathematics that has been used in this report is wrong. Mm -hmm. And also to understand that there is stuff in this report which disturbs politicians as individuals. Yeah. But there is also stuff in this report that is good for politicians and individuals. In my view, young people should get into this report and say, what is it that is constitutional, what is it that is unconstitutional? Mm -hmm. And forget about the private interests of individuals which individuals then want this report to be adopted because it favors their interests. Some want this report to be thrown away because it disturbs their interests. This must not be the basis of young people's activism. The basis of activism for young people is what is it that is constitutional here? What is it that is democratic here? What is it that creates stability for a nation here? Rather than the private and the selfish interests of individual politicians. In my view, if young people view this mess around the limitation in these two ways, they will contribute quite effectively to nation building. Wow, wow, wow. It is so great having you here today. Thank you so much for being here with us. Well, and to you, our guests, see you in the next episode. So, one lesson that I took from this entire discussion is as young people, it's time we stand up and brace ourselves with the Constitution, brace ourselves with what is happening. Well, from me to not enough, Mount Banda, see you, Panda.